Principal, Ananda College, Mr. Lal Sanayaka, Vice Principal, members of the staff, President and members of the OBA, Governor Central Bank, present and old Anandians, ladies and gentlemen. Sanjeeva, thank you very much for that introduction, which was way too long. I hope I can keep everyone on their toes because mine is a relatively controversial subject that I'm talking of. Again, my appreciation to the President, Mr. Bimal Vijay Singh, and the office bearers of the OBA for inviting. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be standing on this stage. As I stand here for the first time, in fact, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects again to my late father and uncle, Dr. B.M.A. Balasurya, who were my role models as I was growing up. My mother, who is present here today, constantly watched over me and challenged me to do better in school. Former principals, in particular Colonel Rajapaksa, and the teachers, prefect of games, coaches, from whom I benefited tremendously in developing my leadership and communication skills, my knowledge, values, discipline, and of course, cricketing abilities. When discussing the subject matter of this of the speech today, I had no hesitation in picking a subject connected to the economy due to the unprecedented crisis the country is at in the moment. And I'm tackling this subject matter not as an economist. We have in the audience a governor who's far more qualified than I am. But based on my own personal experiences and analysis, for someone who enjoyed mathematics at school, I'm relying on data, thanks to the brilliant teaching of Mr. Madagama, Mr. C.M. Viratna. Also, this is not a speech that attempts to praise or blame any government. I've never dabbled in politics, and I do not intend on doing so either. Let me explain why I chose this title, Bridging the Ideological Divide that Caused Sri Lanka's Economic Crisis. What's the definition of an ideology? It's a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic and or political theory and policy. And what's a divide? It's a division. It's a rift. It's a conflict. I believe that the current economic crisis is a result of an ideology that got entrenched over decades, gradually deteriorating Sri Lanka's political culture, its institutions, fiscal discipline, transparency, and above all, the mindset of a generation. We cannot underestimate this crisis. Let me explain. In this century, only eight countries have had sovereign defaults, including Sri Lanka. Others are Argentina, Greece, Ecuador, Venezuela, Lebanon, Zimbabwe, not very nice company. To the best of my knowledge, Sri Lanka is the only country that waited till its usable reserves literally came to zero for less than $20 million of usable reserves at a time of declaring technical bankruptcy, despite being warned of the impending crisis for several years. And by the end of this year, due to the negative GDP growth and currency depreciation, our GDP per capita will reduce to levels that prevailed 10 years ago, translating into a catastrophic drop in living standards that will last for many years. It is therefore a crisis of unprecedented proportions, but we could have avoided this crisis if timely action was taken. I can say this unhesitatingly. There were many who warned the government on Sri Lanka's debt being unsustainable. The IMF in early 2020, and again in their debt sustainability reports in 2021 said so. International banks urged the government to take advantage of a timing opportunity in early 2020 when COVID has just spread throughout the world to restructure their debt. Rating agencies kept downgrading our international credit rating three times in 2020. But what did we do? We simply scolded them. Eminent economists and various think tanks warned the government of the impending doom. No action was taken. And we continue to deplete our foreign reserves. As a concerned citizen of the country, soon after COVID, I too tried to devote time of some of my team members who are some of the best financial brains in the country to make representations to the governor, to the central bank, to finance ministers. First recommendation that we made was in early 2020, 
to hire international debt restructuring specialists and get an independent opinion, at least to see whether our debt was sustainable. I even offered that the exporters would pay for, for this service if the government did not have the funds. Then I sent a note to the central bank to consider the strategy adopted by Ecuador in early 2020, it was still early days during COVID, in order to avoid a disruptive and a disorganized default. And I must show you this slide, which I had sent to the central bank, which shows that Ecuador undertook starting in March 2020, an organized debt restructuring where they started with an international credit rating of B minus, went into an organized debt restructuring under the IMF, obtained six and a half billion dollars from the IMF, restructured 17 billion dollars of debt, and restructuring, I mean, extending the term, reducing the interest rate, asking for a moratorium period. And on the back of the IMF program, secured another $2 billion from Chinese banks and a further couple of billion dollars from multilaterals and came out in nine months with the same credit rating that it had at the beginning of the year. That is how you implement organized debt restructuring, which we failed to carry out. The government had this information in early 2020. And yet, I do not understand why the government failed to act. If it had, the impact of this crisis would not have been so severe. And I again cannot remind, I need to remind you of Appamado Amata Padang not being followed. Actually, my trying to make a system change to avoid this economic collapse, again, at, at that time as a public servant, started way back in 2019. In September, 2019, I was approached by close advisors to the former president, Gotabe Rajapaksa, asking whether I can meet him to advise him on what needs to be done on the economy. I refused because I was holding public office and it is not correct of me to meet presidential candidates. So I did the next best thing. I wrote a strategy document to both presidential candidates, Gotabe Rajapaksa and Sajid Premadasa, giving ideas on how the econo economy should be carried out. And this document was called Lessons from Sri Lanka's Post-Conflict Economic Management and Action to be Taken to Enhance Economic Growth. In this report, I summarized why Sri Lanka's business rankings had gone down. Over the last seven years, ending 2019, our economic growth rate was the slowest in South Asia from being the fastest. African countries were growing faster than us. The World Economic Forum downgraded our competitiveness ranking 33 positions within a period of eight years. Our ease of doing business did not improve, whereas India increased their ease of doing business by leaps and bounds. We ranked 158th in the world in paying taxes. We had 43 different types of taxes compared to nine or so in China and Malaysia. We rank poorly 163rd behind Bhutan, Maldives, in terms of time taken to enforce contracts through courts. Then I highlighted the massive misallocation and fiscal indiscipline that prevailed in the country, where we subsidize education, health, water, electricity, kerosene, fertilizer, transport, and provide transfers through samurdhi and price control. Very little attempt was made to ensure such subsidies are properly targeted and not misallocated. Raj infrastructure projects were implemented with high cost government backed debt without rigorous feasibility analysis and failing to yield required economic and tax returns, which became subsequently a burden on the state. High cost unsolicited proposals became the norm rather than the exception in projects such as roads, bridges, railways, water, which were tied to high cost debt and built-in profit margins to contractors and intermediaries, at times having profits in excess of 30%. Hardly any action was taken to stem the massive losses of state-owned enterprises, which accounted for about 3% of GDP, particularly Sri Lankan Airlines, CEB, Petroleum Corporation, Water Board. There were large revenue leakages from Inland Revenue Customs and Excise, McKenzie, the well-known consulting company, did a quick analysis of two weeks and told the former finance minister, Mangala Samarira, sir, 
leakages from inland revenue is as much as $500 million a year. So I then, in my representation, concluded, this is in 2019, that our fiscal problems are self-inflicted and is a direct consequence of out-of-control line ministries, agencies, and state-owned enterprises showing little regard for fiscal discipline. Then I wanted to point out about implementation bottlenecks. We have an inherent inability to agree on a common position because we get divided with wide groups making representations, trade unions, NGOs, private companies, resulting in inconsistent and ad hoc policy making. The execution capacity of the public sector had reached paralysis levels, where a typical ministry secretary serves on 20-some committees. He hardly has time to run a ministry. Then the fragmentation of the ministries, creation of a multitude of government institutions and agencies with conflicting rules. For example, the agriculture sector is divided amongst eight, nine, ten different ministries, making coordination impossible. So what was my recommendation? I recommended that this was prior to the presidential election, that a national policy planning and implementation commission be set up, chaired by the president, supported by the National Planning Department and what I call a public investment committee chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury, comprising head of external resources and head of the PPP agency, where the optimum methods of allocating funding for investment projects is decided, with the feasibility studies being carried out by National Planning Department, supported by a secretariat to the commission, and a legal and regulatory panel where whatever legal bottlenecks that are there to ensure that investment projects are in, implemented expeditiously would be handled in consultation with the Attorney General. And then what I did was, I went to the cluster principle, similar to how we run private organizations, where every possible subject pertaining to the economy, I classified into eight clusters. And these eight clusters are agriculture and fisheries cluster, including lands, plantation, dairy, minor export crops, etc. The private sector investment facilitation cluster, where we deal with local and foreign investment, tourism, innovation and entrepreneurship. The shipping, aviation and logistics cluster. We are simply only giving lip service to our hub strategy. We are not a hub as yet. Covering ports and airports to ensure coordination. Customs, BOI. Hydrocarbons, power, energy and minerals cluster. We as a country have billions of dollars of mineral resources which we are failing to exploit natural gas, phosphate, titanium, mineral sands, graphite, state enterprise and reforms and capital markets cluster to sort out the problem of SOEs, infrastructure, housing and construction cluster, where roads, railways, bus transportation, water supply, housing development, all of which need to talk to each other, were clustered under this. Digitization and digital infrastructure cluster to ensure customs, inland revenue, government procurement is digitized and it is not yet done and this is one of the causes of fiscal waste, corruption, etc. And finally, the most important human capital and education cluster covering state and non-state universities. Now, my vision was that the issues connected to economic development would be sorted out at the cluster level without being filtered to the president straight away, where the president would have meetings with 45 different people sitting around a table where nothing gets done. This is where the action is, where the line ministry is concerned, would deal with the cluster chairman, who the president can select, whether it's a secretary or a minister, and works towards the common economic agenda, and defend any public investment project before it's put up to the cabinet. So in conclusion, I advise the two presidential candidates in September, October 2019 that our economy is at crossroads. The new president and government will not have the luxury of a thriving economy and will inherit an unprecedented debt burden and lack of fiscal space that will have to be addressed proactively and creatively. Now, some of these matters, points even matter today. Traditional administrative structures and methods will not work. The public service has a leadership vacuum. And I said this note highlights an administrative structure that can tackle the most important economic and investment issues Sri Lanka will face in a systematic and structured manner where economic management in the country will be handled by a team of highly capable people 
drawn from the public and private sector. And my advice to the new president was that he has to build the best economic team the country has seen. Now, this was my two cents worth. I said this because in Sri Lanka, we have no shortage of ideas. We are a bright people. It is just that what is good for the country either does not get done, it gets the, done the wrong way, or it gets ended up in a committee without any idea of how we are going to raise financing. I was then naturally delighted to read page seven of the election manifesto of the former president just three weeks after I sent this note. And this election manifesto stated, we will disband the existing National Economic Council and replace it with a National Policy Planning and Implementation Commission functioning directly under the President to formulate national policies, etc., etc. This will ensure transparency in economic policy formulation and implementation domain. Naturally, I was thrilled. Somebody heard or somebody read my note. But what happened in reality? I have no hesitation in saying this in a public forum for the first time. The setting up of this commission, as stated in the manifesto, I have no reason to doubt that it was scuttled, it was ignored by certain high-ranking officials of the government. Had this been done, the tax cuts of December 2019, which reduced revenue to the state by almost 30%, which was done without any consultation with the finance ministry, may not have happened. Everything went downhill after that, as far as the economy was concerned and our credit rating. The PPP agency that I painstakingly set up on an honorary basis, starting in 2017, was unwound and shut down based on a misrepresentation made to the political leaders by the bureaucrats. I had raised $28 million in technical assistance funding to help implement a $3 billion PPP pipeline. Twelve senior staff were trained with World Bank grant money. I resigned two months after this particular president got elected, hoping that the PPP agency can be saved from these bureaucrats. It wasn't. In March 2020, it was unilaterally wound up, and the $28 million lying in Sri Lanka in a bank account, contributed by the World Bank, went back to the World Bank. And now the government is trying to set it up again. And I'm not going to do that for the third time. Then we saw further reckless behavior in January 2022, when a $500 million bond was repaid, when we had no reserves. There were winners and losers when that bond was paid. The winners were those who had the information that the bond was going to be paid and bought these bonds in the international market at few cents to the dollar, made super profits. Who were the losers? The fishermen who couldn't find kerosene or diesel to go fishing. The three-wheelers who couldn't find petrol to meet their livelihood needs. The sick who did not have enough medicine. That's how reckless. We have been, but I'm not going to talk about it any further because these matters are now before the Supreme Court to figure out who and what caused the economic debacle that we are all suffering from. Then somewhere in May 2021, when the economy was well in a downward trend, I got a visit from another old Anandian and asked me what advice should I give the president. I simply said, change the economic team. Then he said, can I put it forward in a different way. I said, okay, I will present a slide presentation. I'll do a slide, slide presentation to the president where he can understand very clearly what's going wrong with the economy. So now I would like to share with you some of these slides that two old Anandians prepared, myself and another old Anandian who's part of my team, and was sent to an old Anandian, the former president, through an old Anandian, and now it's before you, a wider group of Anandians. When you look at the charts, a few charts, I'm not going to share too much with you, you will see that virtually every economic indicator of Sri Lanka was trending downward for many years, more than 10 years. Now, I wanted the former president to see in a very simple to understand presentation that Sri Lanka's economy was dying a slow death and he needed to change course. My first slide, was asked the question, so the president will get a summary. How did we get to this? We grew our economy on the back of massive borrowings. We did not invest in export orientation. 
All our external debt did not generate sufficient foreign exchange and we forgot about foreign direct investment. And with the GDP growing slow, there was a result of a flawed economic policy and mismanagement. And I said that COVID only made things worse. It is not the reason for the crisis. Now the following charts are all based on central bank data where you can see that the rate of growth after the end of the war, the seven years from 2013 to 19, is actually lower than the period prior to the ending of the war if you exclude the three years immediately after 2019 where we grew at 8 to 9 percent on the back of the conflict ending in 2009. But to grow at 3.9 percent consistently for seven years is unacceptable when in fact during the war years we grew at 5 percent. Why did this happen? We forgot about exports. The line below shows in black as a percentage of GDP manufactured exports from Sri Lanka which was at 32% in 1995 and it declined to 16% by 2019. Whereas Vietnam which started lower than us as a percentage of GDP exports account for manufactured exports account for 80% of GDP. Let's look at foreign direct investment. Now what matters about FDI is what we call what the central bank defines as net inflows net FDI inflows as a percentage of GDP. Now one would expect that net FDI inflows after the war would be higher than during the war. No, it's slightly lower. And also I want to highlight the misconceptions connected to reported FDI volumes. I remember in 2017 and 18 much was said about the highest ever level of two point some billion dollars of FDI being attracted. Let me remind you that when FDI gets reported, 85 to 90 percent of that number is retained earnings reinvested by companies that are already here, not a net FDI inflow, not a net foreign investment inflow. It's rupees staying in Sri Lanka being reinvested. John Keel's Holdings, for example, is 53 percent owned by foreign portfolio investors and is classified as a foreign investment company. And when it builds Cinnamon Life, that gets counted as FDI. Then I looked at reserves. I warned the then president, we are the only country in the region post COVID where reserves have declined. Mongolia increases reserves, Pakistan, Maldives, Bangladesh, Laos. Surely there must be something wrong. Then the next slide, I draw your attention to the 2021 bar shown where in May 2021, debt service as a percentage of loans payable in 2022 reached 131% for the first time in the history. If some of you know mathematics, it doesn't require a rocket kind scientist to find out why the IMF said that our debt was not sustainable. A very simple mathematical calculation would have shown in 2021 that we had no money to pay our debts in 2022. How did this happen? Look at 2009. Our total foreign debt was only four times our reserves. This increased to nine times our reserves by 2020. Between 2000 and 2009, the government, state-owned enterprises and the private sector borrowed on average $1.2 billion per annum for 10 years. That was the foreign debt borrowing. This went through the roof after 2009. Between 2010 and 2014, $22 billion was borrowed in a short period of five years at the rate of $4.4 billion per annum, a 400% increase. Now, we need not, not, we need not have worried if most of this debt was concessional. No. If you look at the early 90s, the beige chart and the green chart, 75% of our borrowings were concessional funding from multilaterals, World Bank. But by the time 2019 came, the pink chart, 52% of our borrowings were expensive commercial debt. Now I'm not complaining about borrowing, governments need to borrow, but it is about the ty type of debt and how we spend that debt 
that matters the most. So, in a nutshell, my final recommendation was, please, Mr. President, create the National Policy Planning and Implementation Commission. Please make use of the resources of the National Planning Department, the Finance Ministry, and the Research Department of the Central Bank to provide support to the Commission. Now, I know for a fact that this report was read by many. However, the results came too late. A few months later, I wrote another note at the urging of senior public servants in the central bank, finance ministry, who were calling me in desperation, saying we don't have a voice, the private sector, urging the government to go to the IMF. So I thought I'll write another note with a catchy political slogan, implications of an IMF program ensuring food security and social protection for low-income families. After all, that should grab someone's attention. So I said that Sri Lanka's most recent credit rating downgrade to CAA2 was a consequence of the credit rating agencies finding the so-called homegrown solution completely lacking in credibility. It can be argued that the homegrown solution of short-term fixes, such as currency swaps, mandatory forex, forex con conversions, waiting for tourism, FDI, and, and remittances to recover will be inadequate. The banks had to curtail their letters of credit. We were heading towards a food crisis. And then we got distracted with remittances increasing in 2020. But I argued that remittances increased in 2020 because there were so many terminations in the Middle East where one-off payments were given to pilots, to housemaids who were being laid off, and they were sending those remittances to Sri Lanka. And remittances never recovered. At the same price, oil prices were rising. So then I finally argued, saying, Entering into an IMF program will be painful in the short term. However, the impact on the poor of not entering into an IMF program is now higher than entering into an IMF program. And therefore, currently, and that was in September 21, the political and economic cost of not going to the IMF is higher than going to the IMF. And these reports were supported, I talked about, the reliance on mathematics by eminent economists such as Professor Prema Chandra Tukoral, where he argued that in high debt countries, economies have recovered faster under an IMF program within two years compared to countries that did not. He also showed data that even the Sri Lankan economy under an IMF program grew faster than outside an IMF program. Now that's all about IMF, but what I have done in the first part of my speech is to have described how I, as a simple investment banker who understood a little bit about economics, had some public sector experience, spent countless hours playing my part in advising the government to take action to avoid an economic crisis, well before COVID. But I failed, and many others who were far more knowledgeable than I also failed. And how could this happen in a country with such talent, because these views are being refuted by autocratic and politicized bureaucrats who are also stifling the views of competent state officers and external parties for making the case to the political leadership. This I know. As I mentioned earlier, I've, re I've been receiving calls from officers of the central bank, finance ministry, saying that they had no voice. And I also know that we, as concerned citizens, failed because the forces that were entrenched were too powerful. They used the power of the law and the power of their position to victimize those who opened their mouths. And that includes myself, which I'm not going to talk about. And at the root of that entrenched interest was arrogance and, yes, corruption, ignorance when you consider the fertilizer ban and possibly geopolitics. Now, those who brought down our economy made false promises to the political leadership and faked data. Data on foreign reserves were not accurate. Then they advised the political leadership that money will come from Japan, China, from the Middle East. I knew as far back as early 2020 that we will not get one red cent from the Middle East 
primarily because of the ban on Muslim, Muslim burials during COVID. Chinese money or Japanese money that was usable did not come, come through. An entire nation was misled by these persons. It is without doubt that Anandians, as mentioned earlier, have excelled in every field, possibly excluding politics. They've certainly excelled in cricket, producing more test cricketers than any other school in the world, armed forces, engineering, science, economics, public service and entrepreneurship. A lot of us have sacrificed for the sake of this country. Recently, I spent hours, countless hours, serving in, in a committee to restructure the power sector. But these sacrifices pale in comparison to the ultimate sacrifices made by possibly hundreds of Anandians who perished during the conflict. They died not just to liberate the North and East, but to help create an environment of peace so that we can emerge as a more prosperous nation. But those who survived the war and were protected by those who made the ultimate sacrifice let this country down. There was no one who celebrated than all of us when peace dawned in our country. We could not have predicted that in 12 short years after the war that we would be bankrupt and become the poster child for the world on how not to manage an economy. Now the next question I'd like to pose is, are we as a nation capable of learning and adjusting course? History does not suggest we can, unless we change the attitudes and mindset of a nation. This is the system change that we need. This is because I have hardly come across Sri Lankans asking one very important question, which I'll show in the next slide. Why did we as a country had to go begging to the IMF for bailouts and support 17 times in the last 45 years to the point where 60% of the last 45 years, we've been under an IMF program. Look at India. They went to the IMF in 1991 when they had a crisis, but never since then. We have gone seven times since 1991. And that is because India embarked on a structural reform agenda driven by a highly competent bureaucracy and an economic team that continues to this day with minimal political interference. And this shows the period in shade that we have been under an IMF program. Now, I like to describe my next slide as what I call the unvirtuous cycle, because we see, keep, seem to be repeating our mistake. So we mismanage our economy, we fail to reform, then we go to the IMF, like what we have done now, then we blame the IMF, which is also happening now, then we partly fix the problem, then we abandon the IMF program and go back to economic mismanagement. This has been the unvirtuous cycle, the opposite of virtuous circle that we have been practicing for the last 40 to 50 years. Now, isn't it time for us to stop blaming the West, China, previous governments and COVID and reflect on our own failures in managing our economy? On the question of what is the right economic model for Sri Lanka, I would again like to be guided by data and not dogma. Now, some say that we must do away with the Western neoliberal economic model. Some say that we must go and become, we must implement an import substitution strategy. Others say that we must go back to the era of Parakram Bahu when we were self-sufficient in rice. But forgetting the fact that in a small economy of, like ours, it is only through productivity improvements driven by trade and exports and investment that we can prosper. Now what I would like to argue is that if you can shed this ideology that the way to economic prosperity, and this is what the data shows, is economic freedom. Let me define what economic freedom is. It is defined as the ability of individuals and families to make their own economic decisions, what to buy, whether to set up a business, where to work, whom to hire, and so on, without interference or hindrance from government or political powerful interests or of its cronies. 
data shows that the drive and ingenuity of individuals and private businesses beats government planning, handouts, price controls in generating economic prosperity. Now what are the components of economic freedom? The size of the government, taxation, I'm not going to go into detail, private property, rule of law, sound fiscal and monetary policy, trade regulations and tariffs, ease of doing business, labor and capital markets. And the results of economic freedom are quite amazing. In the bottom 25% of the least economically free nations globally, the average per capita income is only $1,300. Whereas the top 25% of the most economically free nations, the average per capita in income is more than 20 times greater at $28,000 per year. Now this is data that is presented by the Fraser Institute of Canada, which ranked Sri Lanka 89th out of 165 countries for its economic freedom. We are in the bottom half. Now, what are the top 10 countries with the greatest amount of economic freedom in 2022? I was surprised to see Hong Kong as number one. Then comes Singapore, and we have one other Asian country, Mauritius. Now, the conclusion that I drew from this data, and I keep referring to data, is this. The key takeaway the data shows is that it is not necessarily a particular political system that generates economic prosperity but how competently you run your government and institutions under the government. And that's what you call governance and the degree of economic freedom. Let us look at Sri Lanka's own economic history after July 83. The longest period that we as a country did not go to the IMF was during the seven year period from 1995 to 2001. I would like to argue that this was a period that we followed many principles of economic freedom. Again, I want to remind this is based on data and not because that coincided almost 100% the time that I served as chairman BOI. So let me explain what I mean. Let's take the performance of the telecom sector, which was built on the principles of economic freedom. This is because the government acted as an enabler and a facilitator in the late 1990s by privatizing Sri Lanka Telecom. At that time, there was a two and a half year period. Young Anandias would never remember this. Two and a half year period to wait for a telephone line. And the privatization proceeds were used to retire debt. I don't have data in terms of the last time that we retired debt. We brought in competition. We made compute equipment duty free. I introduced through the BOI a five-year tax holiday for any software business, whether export-oriented or not, including training institutions in software. We set up SLIIT, which now accounts for 50% of all IT graduates, who when they graduate, starting salaries 350,000 rupees a month, 96% have job placement. We declared Malabe as an IT zone. The World Trade Center became an IT park. How did that happen? When I signed the BUI agreement with Virtusa, which today employs more than 10,000 people, they said, we don't have any office space in Sri Lanka with a fiber optic backbone. I immediately went to my board, allocated funding, laid a fiber optic backbone from the top to the bottom of the World Trade Center, and that is where Virtusa started their business. And the results are there to be seen. The IT sector has been the fastest growing export sector in Sri Lanka for the last 25 years until COVID, growing at about 15 to 20% per annum, reaching over a billion dollars in exports. Now, this is where the government steps in to become an enabler through the right policies and then gets out of the way, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is economic freedom. Now, consider how the port of Colombo emerged as a hub, because competition was introduced for the first time through SAGT, which was backed by John Keels and PNO and three other shipping lines. After competition was introduced to the port, ship waiting time reduced by 85%. That is a remarkable statistic. Port productivity improved by 65%. Now what made us do this? We made a decision that the port must never go on strike as it was doing very often during the 1980s. Now after SAGT came, has the port ever succeeded in a strike? No. So what did we do? We gave economic freedom to exporters and importers. Therefore, one way of bridging the ideological divide and confusion on what a suitable economic model for Sri Lanka is to base our views on data and evidence 
and not ideology or populism. I would like to start with what the Buddha said. He said you must embrace the Dhamma only after careful analysis and evaluation and not as a blind faith. By attaining a deep understanding of the Dhamma, you achieve your ultimate goal, Nirvana. Now applying this to economics, in my view, evidence-based policy making through data analysis is your dhamma and not blindly following the dictates of a deeply flawed political leadership as we have done for so long. Attaining a much higher ranking on economic freedom through competence governance and that should be your nirvana in economic terms. I would like to also propose that one of the ways to bridge this ideological divide is to agree on a common economic vision for the country. And I have tried to formulate one, which is my own work. You may disagree with this. Sri Lanka shall take advantage of its location and human capital to implement a hub strategy that will foster growth in shipping, aviation, tourism, financial and digitization services, and an industrial services and agriculture policy underpinned by productivity gains and export orientation. It's very important for us as a country to have an economic vision that everyone rallies behind. Now, I'm also of the view that to bridge the ideological divide, we as a nation need a brand image, which is quite spoilt at the moment, that the world and young people can relate to. That image should reflect progressive thinking, a deep reflection of understanding of self as the Buddha taught us. If you were to believe this doctrine, then I would argue that the country needs a new branding to dispel archaic thinking. And therefore, I propose once and for all not to call ourselves the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. We are neither socialist nor capitalist. And these are labels that have long expired. Saying that we are a democratic or a socialist is like an, each individual wearing a t-shirt or a headband saying we are a Sinhala Buddhist, Tamil, Hindu or Muslim. No, the ideals of our founding fathers of Ananda and us as Buddhists is that we shun such labels. Whatever label we attach to ourselves, such as Sri Lankans or human beings, should apply equally to us all. Therefore, if we are to turn a new chapter, be more appealing to the younger generation and international community, Sri Lanka needs to be rebranded as the Republic of Sri Lanka because that is what I believe we really are. And also, in my view, the principle of economic freedom is, in fact, the middle path. And not socialism or capitalism, which are words that have political connotations. In my view, true socialist countries are in Scandinavia, where tax money has been used to create social safety nets. Now, there are what I call socialist basket cases. Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, that unfortunately share something with Sri Lanka now in common. And that is, I'm ashamed to say this, there are thousands who are trying to leave the shores of these countries, including ours. Now, for the benefit of young Anandians present today, I'd like to show the relationship between economic freedom and cricket. I have asked this question by many, what made us win the 1996 World, World Cup? People say it was Sanat Jayasuriya, Ramesh Kaluvitarana's opening stand, Arjuna's leadership, etc. No. In my view, the foundation for the revival of our cricket was laid in the 1980s. But let me rewind a bit. In the 1950s to 1980s, a majority of players who represented Sri Lanka at cricket came from two schools, Royal and St. Thomas's. Anandians were discriminated against. My coach, Anruddha Polonovita, sir, had to leave his club at the urging of a selector in order to qualify to play for Sri Lanka. Then under Gamani Disanayaka, a shift happened. He democratized cricket. Any cricketer with talent had a fair opportunity to be noticed and be selected regardless of school or ethnic background. And the composition of the 96 World, Bank, World Cup winning team, not a single royalist or Thomian. But of course, in the same vein, I'm sad at the, at, the, at the decline of Ananda cricket, but that's another conversation. So in my theory, the system change was the change in cricket administration. I'm now equating this to the economy. Then came meritocracy. Sudhu Sada 
equal opportunity to be selected, regardless of your background. Then talented cricketers without means were given financial assistance. This is the only part that is socialist in my view, where you assist only the needy in a targeted way. Subsidy should not be enjoyed by all. Then came the mindset change, the crisis, like what we encountered. That mindset change happened in Australia when Murali Dharan was called for no bowling. That raised the morale of the team. Then came leadership and tactics, such as the opening, uh, opening stands of Sanat and, and Kalu. And when we won the World Cup, then came the brand, where Sri Lanka cricket was recognized throughout the world. Now, can you imagine, like what happened in cricket in the late 1980s, providing those with the ability and talent and motivation, the required tools to improve your chances of success within a given economic system. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is economic freedom. Now, there are other barriers, other ideological barriers that hold us back. Let me talk of privatization. So in the late 90s, we asked the question, can a state-owned business compete in a competitive marketplace? There was no evidence, even today, that it can. So the poster child to prove this point is Sri Lankan Airlines. The shaded portion is peacetime, where tourism took off, and also represented the exact timing with which Sri Lankan Airlines was taken over by the government. So until 2008, Sri Lankan Airlines was run by Emirates, and you hardly see any red bars going downwards. It was more or less breaking even. And then, as tourism took off, the losses increased. There's a paradox here. I don't want to go into the details where the losses came from. Now, unlike in the late 1990s, Today, privatization or attracting a PPP investor to lease out land or give a port terminal is referred to as a selling or vikinima. Now, that connotation is that we have lost something forever. That's what vikinima is. You sell it for a price and you've lost it forever. Now, if someone is talking of vikinima, in the same breath, I would like to talk of ugaskirim, mortgaging and compare it with Vikinima. Now, if Vikinima is done correctly, the country gets an investment to an idle asset, like a land or a port terminal. The state gets upfront money when you give a land. It collects future taxes. There's technology transfer, market taxes given by the investors. Consumers are better off through competition, like what happened with telecom. Now, if you take Ugaskirima, the state would give a sovereign guarantee and takes on debt. That leaves less fiscal space for education, health, and social welfare. There's an opportunity cost for that. Then, without a feasibility study, these loans are used to build assets like the Nelung Kuluna, Port of Hambantura, Mattalaya Port, that hardly ever generated a financial or an economic return. Then the state pays the loan from the tax money and the forex reserves, and bears the exchange loss. Consumers and taxpayers are worse off. So to me, Vikinima done correctly has so much more benefits than Ugaskirima. The data proves this. And still, we struggle when we talk of Vikinima. Why has it become a bad word? We have embraced a wrong ideology due to a combination of political rhetoric what I call misplaced patriotism and self-interest. For almost a generation, we glorified our country being mortgaged, mainly to private financial institutions. 53% of our total foreign debt is owed to private financial institutions on commercial terms, and forgot the benefits of a well-formulated FDI and privatizations that benefited the treasury, consumers, and investors, and of course, those who got jobs in those companies. Now, Taking sovereign guaranteed loans, as I mentioned earlier, is not necessarily a bad thing. But if they're properly evaluated. Now, when you do Ugaskirima in the wrong way, like Sri Lankan Airlines and Hambantota Port, you have to do a Vikinima. And the state has to take it back. Now, 
when Wikinema is done wrong, like what happened in the 1980s, State Hardware Corporation, Kahataga Mines, they had to be taken back. But it is important to understand that Wikinema done better is a whole host better for consumers and everyone concerned in our economy than Ugaskirima. Proof is in the next slide, where in 2000, 2016, the Port Authority lost 7 billion rupees, the right hand side column, mainly on account of the loan taken for the Hambantara port. But then when you add the proceeds from the private terminals, Port Authority made a profit of 1 billion rupees. Now still people argue against the Vikinima of East Terminal. To me the data shows that the PPP is a whole host better, whole lot better than the government investing in the East Terminal. The next ideological issue that I want to talk about is about migration of talent. Now, I'm quoting here from research carried out by Professor Ricardo Hausman, where he argued that the secret of economic growth is transfer of knowledge through mobility. Now, what does it mean? If you take Silicon Valley, almost half the Fortune 500 companies were founded by American immigrants or their children. If you take the origin of Sil Silicon Valley, STEM workers, science, technology, engineering, and management, foreign workers, foreign-born workers account for 57% of Silicon Valley. Now, let's look at Sri Lanka. Singapore, 46% of its workforce is foreign-born. In Hong Kong, 40% of the workforce is foreign-born. Now, these are the top two countries for economic freedom. In Sri Lanka, less than 0.2%, or only 40,000 people. Now, I'm not asking about opening the floodgates. What I'm talking about is this. For each new job created in the IT sector, four other local jobs are created outside the sector through multiply effect. For every foreign tourist that comes to Sri Lanka, five direct and indirect jobs are created. Similarly in the US, for every foreign born worker in the US, US STEM graduates, 2.3, 2.6 US STEM graduates receive jobs. Now in Sri Lanka, we are a net exporter of the best brains. On average, in 2017, 23% of engineering and science graduates and 20% of computer science graduates have left Sri Lanka to work abroad. And on top of that, we make it very difficult for STEM graduates from, who are foreign-born to come and work in Sri Lanka. It's extremely difficult. So what results in that? This is our net migration. Now you will see that the, the chart to the bottom is how many people have left our shores. Then in 2014, 15, 16, 17, there was a change. We, there was a net inflow of qualified people to our country after the war ended. However, if you look at 22 statistics, I'm sure this, this is reversed. So what should Sri Lanka do to move forward? The country and the government will need to open up for more inflow of know-how the way all prosperous countries have done. In Thailand, for example, a foreigner receives a 10-year residence visa if he generates only four Thai jobs. In India, the IT revolution in the early 1990s started with Indian immigrants who went to the US who came back with access to markets and investment. So therefore, we as a country need to shed this ideology of fearing competition, more FDI, more brain power needs to be attracted to complement and to counter the exodus of brain power from our country. Now I have been asked by some, what aspects have contributed to my growth as a leader? It's simply diffusion through mobility. Asia Capital, for example, was the first financial services company to give a minority stake to a foreign investment bank. We were the first financial services company where the two founders who ran the business, myself and my colleague, 
we stepped down and hired an Englishman as the CEO because we felt that we can gain from his knowledge from London, which was the financial uh, center at that time. Now, I learned to compete internationally, not merely by getting a deal based on who I know, but based on self-improvement. So it is this competition and not handouts that enhances your skills, whether you are an individual or a business. The same applies to trade. This is an important point for everyone to know when we shed our archaic ideologies. Now, we call ourselves a hub nation. We want to become a shipping and aviation hub. But let's look at the data. Trade as a percentage of GDP is going in the wrong direction. Trade as a percentage of GDP is import your ex and exports as a percentage of GDP has gone down from 42% to 43% over the last 25 years. Whereas in Vietnam, it has increased from the same levels that we had in the 1990s to 181%, Thailand 117%, and Singapore 338% of GDP is trade. Because it's a hub nation, it's a trading nation, it is also a manufacturing nation. Manufacturing requires imports, because that's what we call a global value chain. Increasingly imported goods are required to manufacture finished goods. And then we complain about not having enough we complain about free trade agreements. We have the lowest number of free trade agreements compared to our neighbors. Republic of Korea has 16, India has 13. We have only two or three that are actually operational out of the five. Now let us look at the data again to get over this phobia of free trade agreements that are negotiated properly. They have to be negotiated properly. What does the data reveal in terms of the Indo Lanka free trade agreement? Now, the agreement was signed in 2000. Our exports in five years, up to 2005, grew by tenfold, a thousand percent in five years. And 97% of our exports were under the preferential tariff items. Whereas, when India exported to us, to Sri Lanka, only 18% came under preferential tariff items. Tata buses, Maruti cars were not part of the preferential tariff agreement. Full duty had to be paid that came outside the preferential tariff items. So if you look at trade under the preferential tariff items, Sri Lanka often runs a surplus with India. That is how you negotiate free trade agreements. And the success that this free trade agreement, you have to only consider Damro or Siet, which have generated much exports for Sri Lanka. Now this is the final part of my speech. My apologies for taking so long. Now, I'd like to quote some history. Over the last few decades, Sri Lanka has been subject to a culture of dependency and servitude. For example, a dependency on politicians for jobs and handouts, when in fact the job of a politician is to set the policies that would generate the jobs and pro through productive investments. State enterprises are being used as job banks. There is an unholy rent-seeking nexus between certain elements of the private sector and the government that results in lost tax revenue, corruption, wasted resources, and a mountain of debt. Above all, Sri Lanka has suppressed the voices of reason while embracing an economic ideology and dogma propagated by a political class that created this culture of dependency, perpetuated by a few bureaucrats who themselves failed in their duty in providing the correct advice to the ruling class and therefore serve their masters and themselves and not the country. From 1995 to 2001, and this is the only name I'm going to mention in my speech, we had no reason to go to the IMF because of the bureaucratic leadership given by probably one of the best Secretary of the Treasury and governors I have worked with, Mr. H. Javadana. He played a role in changing the economic ideology of Chandrika Bandarana and Kumaratunga from left-leaning ideology to a more centrist platform that I have defined in this oration as economic freedom. Before I end my speech, I would like to go back further in history, 175 to 200 years, when there was a situation that was mentioned earlier where Buddhism was threatened. Now to quote from Sanjeeva's Alcott oration in 2014, it says, 
for a period of almost 200 years buddhism was in decline in the absence of royal patronage with rulers being preoccupied with survival now today our country's economy has hit rock bottom becoming the first country in asia for 50 years to declare bankruptcy when in fact we are at the center of one of the world's fastest growing regions led by india bangladesh maldives and bhutan and this is also a result of our rulers being preoccupied with survival and at the same time we have weakened and politicized the key institutions that could have helped us in this crisis the central bank and the ministry of finance therefore it is my view that the time has emerged for a new force similar to when venerable mohati batte gunananda ter emerged to challenge the christians to defend their faith via a series of debates the first that you admit then gampola and finally 1873 the panaduravada now the impact of that debate was remarkable both locally and internationally there was a book published by mr j m peebles in the us in 1878 based on these debates called buddhism and christianity face to face now it is after reading a copy of this book that henry steel alcott our founder came to sri lanka in 1880 now with the arrival of colonel alcott the buddhist revival movement accelerated as pointed out by other orators today and he described venerable mohati vatte gunananda as to quote the most brilliant polemic orator of the island he is the terror of missionaries with a very intellectual head and the most brilliant and powerful champion of buddhism even those of the christian faith praise gunananda ter therefore it is now time for our country to produce the equivalence of the venerable mohote gunananda ter and henry c lolcut and embrace their approach to build strength in numbers one individual cannot do this to lead the revival of an economy that is built on cons- consistent and evidence based principles with independence of institutions in charge of the economy protected and the dignity of the public service revived i urge anandians to play a catalytic catalytic role in facilitating this change our very future depends on it and the changes required for our economic revival must be institutionalized and legislated in in order to instill discipline in the system else we will not gain credibility as a nation and will forever be coming in and out of wildly fluctuating economic cycles characterized in the last 50 years i would like anandians to form the equivalent of a theosophical society for the revival of the economy the theos- theosophical society's founding principles were laudable a center for strengthening of universal brotherhood without distinction of race religion sex caste or color and to encourage the study of comparative religions philosophy and science so similarly for the economy we would need to have a series of debates or round tables that we as anandians can organize similar to the panaduravada where we can compare with data comparative economic systems we can promote progressive ideas and to seek to educate change attitudes dispel economic myths we need to engage with economic thinkers of all parties including some parts of the radicalized youth movements in order to generate a consensus on reforms we need to ensure that entrepreneurship is nurtured at every level also my earlier suggestion of setting up a national policy planning and implementation commission is just one such idea which also needs to be debated maybe others have better ideas but at this moment sadly there's too much of a divide between the ideologies of politicians the private sector special interest groups trade unions and the and the student movement we need a force of unity that can at least narrow these differences this needs to happen yesterday and we can we as anandians can be the agents of change i believe can this change also include every student at anand being taught basic economics and finance so that they have a deeper understanding of the issues that caused our country's economic downturn and therefore a mindset change 
can happen at a very young age. I am deeply disturbed as a citizen of the country seeing self-interest prevailing over the interests of the country. This has resulted in a breakdown of, in our value system and people not having faith or trust in parliament or the institutions. Now history reminds us that dictators and despots arise during times of severe economic crisis. Now I don't want that to happen in our country. And if we as Anandians can take action to bridge this ideological and ethical divide that caused this economic crisis, I'm willing to assist in any way which I can because the future of this country depends on it. And finally, a quote by Mr. VTS Sivaguru Nadan, a product of Jaffna Hindu College and a teacher and a headmaster at Ananda for 25 years. This is what he said in 1958 and thanks again Sanjeev for highlighting this quote. And may I remind you all that you are one and all the proud inheritors of a sacred trust. And it is for you and me to see that Ananda does not become a lifeless state school, is not satisfied with being merely a single Abudi school, but grows into a greater and greater Ananda, so that it may continue to be the hub of all national education activities, the hub of the Commonwealth of the Silenese people of Lanka. Surely, Ananda can also become the hub of modern, progressive economic thinking to change attitudes and values of a, hope, of a whole people and a whole country. I would like to live in that hope for the rest of my days. Thank you.